We're in on this Labor Day weekend. Hopefully you're enjoying a nice long weekend. I am. We've had two weeks of school so far, and after two weeks of school, it's nice to have four days because I'm exhausted. So I'm thankful for that. But it's so good to have you here. It's nice to have a Josiah and Becca with us today. So that, that's an awesome treat whenever they come and help us out and praise. And, uh, but it's so good to see everybody here this morning. Let's open up with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, what a great day. What a great Sunday morning. You've given us the breath of life in our lungs to get up this morning. As we were discussing this morning in prayer group, each day is a gift from you. We don't know what each day is going to bring. So, Lord, each day is a gift. We thank you for that. We thank you for this church, this church body. Thank you for the unity we have. We thank you for our brothers and sisters in the Lord, our guests today, who have come to, to help lead us in praise. We thank you for our praise team. I pray that our worship would be sincere today. That right now that you would take away all distractions that we have, worldly distractions, things that we have to do all this week, even this afternoon, that we would put those away, that our focus would be on exalting your name this morning, that we would lift you up, for only you are worthy. Lord, I pray, I pray that we would feel the presence of the Holy Spirit within us today as we worship as we study your word, Lord, your word is precious, finer than gold. And I pray, Lord, that as the word goes out today, that you would challenge us, that the Holy Spirit would take the message and, and move us. Lord, we, we thank you again for this church. I pray that this would be a great time in your house this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church. Good morning. Hallelujah. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Yes, amen. Let's stand and worship our King who's soon to come.
God we serve worthy? Amen. Is he worthy, saints? Amen. 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 He is worthy. Hallelujah. He is the only one that's worthy to open this world. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. He's the only one who's worthy to be worshipped. Hallelujah. Let's worship the Lord.
always belongs to him. He's always faithful, always true, always there. Never, ever will he forsake us. Amen? Amen. Always.
Good morning, Maria. Good morning. A special shout out this morning to Dr. Kim, Kayla, and Matthew. Out in the cornfields of Indiana. Good morning to everybody who's online with us today on the business. I've been blessed already. Have you been blessed already? Wasn't that awesome? Beautiful words and the praise team. You did oh, such a great job. So I, I've been blessed. Those are those great, great words to those songs as we lifted up the name of our Heavenly Father. We're in our series in the book of Judges. If you have your Bible, you can be looking in Judges chapter 8. The verses will also be above me on the screen. I love to see people maturing. In the last two weeks, we've been taking a look at Gideon. And Gideon has really matured in the last two weeks. It's really one of the things I love about teaching. I've been teaching for a long time, and sometimes I'll have a junior high class of boys with the attention span of about five seconds. And I look at those junior high boys, and I go, oh boy, we're in trouble. Our future of the United States, we're in trouble. But then, 20 or so years later, I'll be walking through Kroger's or somewhere, and somebody will come up to me, and they say, Coach Bosla? And I'll say, yes. And I'll see a very mature person, wife, three kids. Do you remember me when I was in your seventh grade? <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> sometimes, yes. You know, what are you doing? Well, I'm an engineer at Ford. I'm a doctor at Henry Ford. I'm going, whoa! There's no way you would have per persuaded me of that when they were in 7th and 8th grade. But, but they've matured. And in our spiritual walk, we're supposed to be maturing. Every day, every week, every year. I tell you one thing, 2020 has been a great year to mature in with COVID. How you re re reacted to this whole virus, we've had an opportunity in a difficult time to grow. So I've been really just encouraged the last couple of weeks watching Gideon. You know, two weeks ago, we see Gideon, he's a scaredy cat. He's threshing wheat in a wine press because he's scared of the Midianites. And he gets visited by an angel of the Lord. And the angel of the Lord says, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. No way was getting a mighty warrior at the start. He's hiding from the enemy. But the angel of the Lord promised God victory over the Midianites. And he started with a small job. Yes, he did perform a miracle, which helped with Gideon's faith. But he started small. And he said, I want you to tear down your father's altar to Baal. So being the brave, he wasn't really brave. He went at nighttime with 10 of his servants, and he tore down this Baal. And he still lacks some confidence, and because God says, you're going to defeat the Midianite army. Amen. And he goes out and he recruits 32,000 soldiers. Now, you have to remember, the enemy had 135,000, Gideon had 32,000. Gideon says... You know, God, can you just show me one more thing? I'm going to throw out a fleece. And if it's wet in the morning and the ground is dry, that's going to help me. Next morning, that's what happened. So Gideon goes back to God. God, I know you're probably going to be mad at me. But can I ask for you to do it one more time? This time, I want the fleece to be dry and the ground wet. 
God did it again. So Gideon goes out with his 32,000, and we looked at this last week, and God is still going to test his faith. He goes to Gideon, and he goes, those 32,000 men, you have way too many people. Gideon's thinking, now wait a minute, the enemy has 135,000. 32,000 is too much? God says, yes, because when victory comes that I'm promising you, your men are going to boast that they did it in their own strength. I want them to boast in my strength and give the glory to me. So, if you remember Gideon, and under God's direction, anybody who is scared gets to go home. 22,000 people left. So, you know, now he's got 10,000 people, and God says, your army's still too big. Can you imagine Gideon? My army's st still too big. They take him down to the river, and the Bible really doesn't say why he picked people like this. Some people can speculate. But 300 people came down and took water with their hand and lapped it up. The rest of the army put their face down in the water and drank the water. And God says, keep those 300 men that lapped it, and that's going to be your army. And the others went home. Gideon's faith is growing, but he still needed some assurance. So God told him to go down to the edge of the camp, the Midianite camp, at nighttime. So Gideon took a servant down to the edge of the camp, and he heard two Mennonite soldiers talking. And one had a bad dream that night, and the other soldier was helping to interpret that dream. And the interpretation of the dream was that Israel was going to win the battle. Yes, and God has already promised this a number of times. So Gideon goes back a new man. He goes back full of confidence. He's maturing in the Lord. He goes back and says, okay, guys, here's what we're going to do. Everybody has 300 trumpets, 300 torches, and 300 jars. When all the other soldiers went home, they left the trumpets and the torches with the 300 that were left. He says, we're going to encircle the enemy camp. And at 10 o'clock at night, you follow my lead. What I'm going to do is I'm going to break the jar shine the torch, I'm going to blow the trumpet, and we're going to yell, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. So the enemy soldiers, you know, they're starting to go to sleep. It's a change in the, in the midnight watch. And all of a sudden, they're surrounded by light, trumpets, people shouting. Usually in warfare, a trumpet, a person who blows a trumpet, is followed by a large army. Well, they heard 300 trumpets. So they figured that there was a huge army. They're half asleep. God throws them into confusion. They start killing each other. And then they start running. They start running. And then we come to... Uh, I'm, I'm actually going to back up to chapter 7, reading at verse 24 here. And we'll p pick up on the story. Gideon sent messengers throughout the hill country of Ephraim, saying, Come down against the Midianites and seize the waters of the Jordan ahead of them, as far as Beth Barah. So all the men of Ephraim were called out, and they seized the waters of the Jordan as far as Beth Barah. They also captured two of the Midianite leaders, Oreb and Zeb. They killed Oreb at the rock of Oreb and Zeb at the winepress of Zeb. They pursued the Midnites and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon, who was by the Jordan. Ephraim was a large tribe. They were not originally asked to be in the battle by Gideon. They were part of the mop-up mission. Uh, Gideon knew that the enemy was escaping to Jordan, so he calls on Ephraim to go to Jordan and attack the enemy army 
as they're crossing the Jordan. And they do. They're very successful. They capture two of the enemy soldiers, or enemy generals, rather. Now, 15,000 of the enemy soldiers did escape through the Jordan. But there was a major battle, and Ephraim did a very good job at the fords of the Jordan. So we come to chapter 8, and here's, the, here's what I like to say. Everybody lived happily ever after. Wrong. <laughs> Wrong. And this is the trouble, uh, troublesome part of chapter 8. I almost wish chapter 8 was not in the Bible. So many times in the Bible, you see godly people doing great things, great victories, but they don't end up well. They don't finish the race well. It's really sad. We have a lot of modern day examples of this. Great men and women who just at the end of their life did not finish well. And we, we could put Gideon. Gideon is in the Hall of Fame of Faith in chapter 11. But he becomes a little bit unraveled in chapter 8, as we're going to see. It's been said that after a battle, any landmines that exist after the battle, let us be watchful after the victory as before the battle. I believe it's very true that many people find it easy to follow the Lord during a difficult time, but when good times come, they fall away from the Lord. I'm going to see that in Gideon. So after Gideon has his victory, God provided the victory in a miraculous way. He still had some landmines to get around in his life. Take a look at verse 1 of chapter 8. Now the Ephraimites asked Gideon, Why have you treated us like this? Why didn't you call us when you went to fight Midian? And they challenged him vigorously. Ephraim was a proud tribe. And one thing about you're going to find out quickly, all the complaints go to you. When you're a leader, be ready for complaints to come because they're coming. Ephraim came right to Gideon and said, Get better than the full grape harvest of Abizar. God gave Oreb and Zeb, the Midian, Midian leaders, into your hands. What was I able to do compared to you? At this, their resentment against him subsided. Gideon is slick here. This is a good job. Do you talk about conflict resolution? He uses flattery here. Hey, Ephraim, you did a great job in this. You captured the leaders. You're the gleanings from your harvest. Your leftovers when you harvest your grapes is better than our main harvest in my hometown. And he, he really built them up. You know, Proverbs 15.1 says this. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Gideon really displayed this here as a leader. He was wise to just flatter Ephraim and give them credit. Because they're a team, and everybody has a role to play in a team. And all the roles are important. Ephraim, yes, was part of the mop-up operation, but that was an important part. You know, it's like that in a church. Everybody has roles to play. They're all important. Now, there's visible roles. I mean, me being up here, that's visible. The praise team, they're visible. But the person during the week that makes a phone call to someone else in the congregation... That's a very important role. Amen. The person who says, hey, I'm going to the store. What do you need? I'm going to bring groceries over to your house. That's an important role. People that clean the church when no one's looking, that's an important role. 
All those roles are important. They might not be visible, but all the roles are important in building up the church. And that was what Gideon was trying to um, tell the tribe of Ephraim. So you take a look at verse 4 and 5. Gideon and his 300 men, exhausted, yet keeping up the pursuit, came to the Jordan and crossed it. He said to the men of Sukkoth, Give my troops some bread. They are worn out, and I'm still producing Zeba and Zomona, the kings of Midian. You have to remember that those 300 troops that Gideon had, the fight's not over. Now they're chasing 15,000 soldiers. But they have confidence. They saw what the Lord had done. And they're ready to go after the enemy. Now this city, Sukkoth, comes from the tribe of Gad. These are Israelites. And Gideon's men are hungry. They're, they just fought a war that they're pursuing. So they stop and they ask for some bread. Hospitality was huge in this culture. If you were an Israelite, you would do anything to help another Israelite. So in this situation, it should be no problem to feed these 300 men. But take a look what happens in verse 6. But the officials of Sukkoth said, Do you already have the hands of Zeba and Zalamna in your possession? Why should we give bread to your troops? Wow. That's a harsh answer. You know, there's a lot going on here. This city had already been harassed by the Midianites. They really don't have full confidence in Gideon and his troops. If they feed Gideon and their troops and the 300 men go and fail, the Midianites are going to come back and they're going to say, hey, we heard that you helped Gideon. And they would destroy the people. So they really did not have faith in their fellow uh, Israelites, so they gave a harsh answer. Take a look at verse 7. Then Gideon replied, Just for that, what the Lord has given Zeba and Zalamna into my hands, I will tear your flesh with, with desert thorns and briars. Gideon is not happy. He is not happy at all here. Remember Gideon? He was that quiet guy threshing wheat in the wine press. We start to see a little bit of a character change going on with Gideon here. Take a look at verse 8 and 9. From there he went up to Peniel and made the same request of them. But they answered the men of Sukkoth. They, I'm sorry, but they answered as the men of Sukkoth had. So he said to the men of Peniel, When I return in triumph, I will dare tear down this tower. The town had a special tower, a special landmark. So Joshua says, Because you're not willing to feed us, and they were in the same situation as Sukkoth, they were afraid to support um, Gideon and his troops. You know, it's really sad. It's sad when godly people do not support their fellow brothers. And it's sad also in the Christian church. Christians often fight against Christians, and often Christians not to support, they don't support each other. We should be attacking Satan. Satan's our enemy. And sometimes Christians spend so much time and energy attacking each other. Psalm 133.1 1 says, How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. 
I think one of the most challenging verses in the Bible is when Jesus is talking about the final judgment in Matthew 25. And he comes um, to verse uh, 14. I, I'm sorry, uh, 25. Uh, I started with verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. As Christians, we need to be sensitive to the needs of, of our brothers and sisters around us. We should also recognize when someone is being used by God and they have the power of God. In this case, Gideon was being used by God to defeat the enemy. Sukkoth and Peniel, they should have supported Gideon. But they did it. And there's going to be some consequences, unfortunately, for that. Take a look at verse 10. Going back to Judges chapter 8. Now Ziba and Zalumna, it seems like every time I say these names, I say it a different way. <laughs> so I look up how to say these words. I say I'm really good on Saturday night. For some reason, on Sunday morning, they don't come off the tongue as easy. They were in Karkar, Karkar with a force of about 15,000 men all that was left of their armies, of the eastern people, 120,000 swordmen had fallen. Gideon went up the route of the nomads east of Noba and Jogbiha. Sounds like a nice city to run in. Jogbiha. <laughs> and attacked the unsuspecting army. Ziba and Zomana, the two kings of Midian, fled. But he pursued them and captured them routing their entire army. Wow, praise God. Again, 300 soldiers. Numbers mean nothing to God. One person in God is a majority. I mean, just God is a majority. And numbers mean nothing to God. And throughout the Bible, we see that God can do so much with so little. Two fish, five loaves. What's in your lunch bucket, right? Do you have two fish and five loaves? God can use you. You just have to be available. Bring it to the Lord. And say, God, use it. Take a look at verse 13. Now, he's got the two captured kings. Gideon, son of Joash, then returned from battle by the pass of Heres. He caught a young man from Sukkoth and questioned him. And the young man wrote down for him the names of 77 officials of Sukkoth, the elders of the town. And remember, this is the city that did not feed Gideon. Then Gideon came and said to the men of Sukkoth, Here are the two kings, Ziba and Zalomana, about whom you taunted me by saying, Do you already have the hands of Ziba and Zumana in your possession? Why should we give bread to your exhausted men? He took the elders of the town and taught the men of Sukkoth a lesson by punishing them with desert, thorn, and briars. He also pulled down the tower of Peniel and killed the men of the town. Wow. So the question comes up. He forgave the tribe of Ephraim when they complained. 
Now, these two towns, he wasn't as forgiving. It shows that Gideon had discernment as a leader. You have to handle each case differently. But Gideon is going out and killing fellow Israelites. Again, you're seeing a little bit of a character change here. You're seeing a little bit of a character change. Was he taking uh, revenge into his own hands? Should he have left it up to God? Some, com some commentators said he was justified. Some say, ah, this maybe was a mistake in going out of the way and punishing his fellow Israelites. Let's take a look at verse 18. Then he asked Ziba and Zamanah, what kind of men did you kill at Tabor? So he's interrogating them. Men like you, they answered, each one, um, each one with the bearing of a prince. Gideon replied, those were my brothers, the sons of my own mother. As surely as the Lord lives, if you would spare their lives, I would not kill you. In this interrogation, he finds out that in previous raids, Gideon's brothers were killed by the enemy. And he finds out that these two generals were responsible for killing his brothers. That's not a good um, situation. They didn't have a police force back then. You know, they were defunded. Oh, no, no I won't go there. <laughs> they won't go there. Uh, they, they didn't have a police force. According to the Mosaic law, if someone killed a family member, you got your family together, and you went and you had justice performed. You went out and killed the murderer. So Gideon has every right to kill them now. And there's a legacy. This is very important how, how soldiers were killed. Let me read the next verse. Turning, in verse 20, Gideon, turning to Jether, his oldest son, he said, kill them. But Jether did not draw his sword because he was only a boy and was afraid. Back in that culture, for a soldier, for a warrior, how you died was a reflection on your reputation, on your legacy. You had to die the right way. In the next chapter, we're going to see that there's a guy named Abimelech. In fact, he, in fact he's one of Gideon's sons who gets too close to a tower and a lady drops a millstone and it lands on his head. And he's about to die and he doesn't want to be killed by a lady. So he asks a fellow soldier to put a sword through him because he doesn't want to die with the lady. Do you remember the story of Jael and Sisera? That was terrible. That was for Sisera to be, to be killed by a lady. You don't, she nailed him. She nailed it. You're right. That's not how you go out. Even King Saul, you don't want to be killed by your enemy. King Saul was being pursued by the Philistines. His sons were killed. They're, they're right on his trail. He knew that he had it. So he asked his arm bearer to kill him. His arm bearer says, I can't. So Saul fell on his own sword. How you died was important back then. So Gideon says, I'm going to humiliate these generals. I'm going to have my son kill him. And the honor will go to my son. Now the son was young. He's got two generals in front of him. They hand him a sword. And he's probably going... Now, if you were those generals, would you want a young boy to kill you? That would be a slow death. I don't know about you, but if I go, I want to go quickly. I want to go quickly. So I think the two generals, you know, saw this. In verse 21, 
Zabab and Zumana said, Come, do it yourself. As is the man, so is his strength. Now they got Gideon mad. So Gideon stepped forward and killed them and took the ornaments off their camel necks. I'll get to that in a second. So Gideon's quickly. Again, that's probably how they wanted to go out. I know the Bible can be sort of gruesome at times, but that, that's how it was. But here's where things start to turn. I want you to take a look at verse 22. The Israelites said to Gideon, Rule over us, you, your son, and your grandson, because you have saved us from the hand of Midian. The people wanted to make Gideon their king and their son king, and that they wanted a legacy. What did God think about that? God did not like that. It, it was supposed to be a theocracy. God was their king. Now, Gideon did a great job answering here. But Gideon told them, I will not rule over you, nor will my son rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. That's a proper answer. We have to give Gideon credit for that. Do you notice in verse um, 22 that people said, because you have saved us from the Midianites. It wasn't Gideon that saved the people. It was God. And one of the problems here is that people were putting their trust in a man instead of God and wanted to make him king, as if the king was going to solve all the problems. Way back in Deuteronomy, God told Moses and warned Moses, you know what? The people are going to want a king someday. That's not good. Because here's what the king's going to do. He's going to accumulate wealth. He's going to uh, tax you. He's going to have many wives. God is your king. That's what's unique about Israel. Israel could say, God is our leader. Do you remember the story of um, even Samuel? Uh, when Samuel uh, was a prophet right before King Saul, God, uh, in chapter 8 of 1 Samuel, let me just read a couple of verses with verse 4. Saw the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, You are old, and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. But when they said, Give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord told him, Listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they, that they have rejected. They have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods. So they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly, solemnly that let them know that the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. So Israel was warned the danger of having a king. But the big danger is people would put their trust in the king. Let me tell you something in the United States of America. A lot of times you and I think this way. That if our candidate wins in November, all of the problems are going to be solved. We think that way sometimes. All of our problems are going to be solved. If our party, whatever party you belong to, gets the Senate, the House, the President, all the problems are going to be solved. That's wrong. The problems won't be solved. Because then you're putting your trust in man. We need to be putting our trust in God. In that. And you know, so, some Christians are so vocal about their political party, that their neighbors, their family, they know them, number one, 
as a Democrat or a Republican or Libertarian and maybe, maybe a Christian. That's wrong. You should be known as a Christian, number one, and then maybe a political party. But you should be known for your Christian convictions and your beliefs. Our trust is in God. Our, as our money says, in God we trust. So I, I think we need, to be, we need to be careful. And I know we all, I, and I, I have my political views, and, uh, and certainly there's certain biblical principles that I'm all for. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm pro-life. I'm for traditional marriage. I'm for freedom of religion. I'm for law and order. There's certain principles I strongly believe in. But I want to be known as a Christian first compared to my political party. By the way, next week, uh, I hope you come. We're, we're not done with this week, but next week, uh, I hope to bring a message on what should be our involvement as Christians in politics? Uh, what should be our involvement in our local government? What should we be doing? And not only are we going to have a sermon, we're going to start Sunday school next week. And in the Sunday school, I'm going to interview three or four people from our church, and we're going to have a discussion on what is our role as Christians in our political system? What should we be doing? So come next week, right? We'll, we'll, we'll be starting Sunday school after uh, a break from the sermon. Take a look at verse 24. We're getting near the end here. Um, and he said, this is Gideon. And he said, I do have one request that each of you give me an earring from the share of the plunder. It was custom of the Ishmaelites to wear gold earrings. The Ishmaelites were related to the Midianites. They answered, we'll be glad to give them. So they spread out a garment and each of them threw a ring from his plunder into it. The weight of the gold rings he asked for came to 1,700 shekels. That's like about 40 pounds. Not counting the ornaments, the pendants, and the purple garments worn by the kings of Midian or the chains that were on the camels' necks. Gideon made the gold into an ephod, which he placed in Oprah, his town. All Israel prostituted themselves by worshiping it there, and it became a snare to Gideon and his family. Even though Gideon rejected the offer to live as a king, in his retirement, he wanted to live like a king. He became rich, very wealthy. It wasn't your normal retirement of a warrior or a judge. He became very, very rich. We're going to find out that even though he rejected the kingship, that in the next chapter, we're going to find out that he had 71 sons. That he had many wives. What was the warning about a king? Many wives and wealth. And he, they only list the sons. He had 71 sons. What about the daughters? They don't list that. So he had many wives. He was a wealthy man. His one, he had one son by a concubine who lived in Shechem, which is a Canaanite town. And his name was Abimelech. He's the one that got hit in the head with the millstone. His name was Abimelech. Abimelech means son of a king. He named his son son of a king. So even though he denied being king, he lived like a king. Now, this is an ephod. We have a picture up here. An ephod is what the high priest wore. The main description is in Exodus 28. And it had gold, blue, purple, scarlet yarn, finely twisted uh, linen. It was like an apron that the high priest would wear. And it had a lot of gems and, again, gold, silver, 
there was a lot that went into that, that garment. So let's give Gideon the benefit of the doubt. Maybe he had this ephod made as a symbolic memory of God's great victory. Let's say that. We'll give him the benefit of the doubt. Maybe he made this. He wasn't a high priest. So if he wore it, he was wrong for wearing it. But it was displayed. And we have to be careful. It, was, it symbolized the great victory, but people started to worship it. And we need to be careful as Christians of what we worship. Now, we have the cross. We sing songs like we cherish the old rugged, rugged cross, and we do. But we, got, we have to be careful that we don't worship the wooden cross or think of it as a good luck charm. We wear it on our neck, hang it in our car. It's, a good, it's not a good luck charm. We look past the cross to our Savior who died on the cross and paid the penalty for our sin on the cross and rose again. And it should make us remember that and give thanks. But we shouldn't worship the cross and think of it as a lucky charm. Here, when Gideon put this ephod in display in his hometown, people started to worship it. When they said they, they prostituted themselves, that word is used as far as idolatry in the Old Testament, that the people were unfaithful in their devotion to the true God, and they worshiped a false God. And, that's what, and the second, in the Ten Commandments, which we did earlier this year, the second commandment, don't make or worship any graven image. Don't bow down. So we have to be careful. We do have to be careful. Even in Christianity, we've got to be careful of what we truly worship. I understand that when people go to the Holy Land, sometimes they sell things like people claim that there's pieces of the cross, a wooden piece to the cross. And they've estimated that throughout the years, if you were to add up all those pieces, you could make like 200, 300 trees, right? And uh, so, but people like little objects, and they think they're special, and they worship. Yes, we do, we do cherish the cross. Last week, we said the cross is a little bit like our wet fleece to Gideon. It shows us that God loves us. He's on our side. He loves us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It shows us that God is in control. It was all part of God's plan for Jesus to die on the cross. That was part of God's plan. And then it shows us that through the resurrection that we have victory over death and sin. God gave us, offers us victory. So we have victory. So that's why we cherish the old rugged cross. So we see that it's sort of a sad thing that Gideon did at the end. Let's close up this, uh, this chapter. Verse 28. Thus Midian was subdued before the Israelites and did not raise its head again during Gideon's lifetime. The land had peace for 40 years. Jerob Baal, or Gideon, son of Joash, went back uh, home to live. He had 70 sons of his own, for he had many wives. His concubine, who lived in Shechem, also bore him a son, whom he named Abimelech. Gideon, son of Joash, died at a good old age and was buried in the tomb of his father Joash in Oprah of the Abizarites. No sooner had Gideon died than the Israelites again prostituted themselves to the Baals. They set up Baal Bereth as their god and did not remember the Lord their God who had rescued them from the hands of of all their enemies on every side. They also failed to show any loyalty to the family of Jerobbaal, that is Gideon, in spite of all the good things he had done for them. Gideon missed, missed a great opportunity here for spiritual revival in the land. He could have come back. The people were very loyal to him. Instead of exalting God in spiritual revival, 
Unfortunately, he started to accumulate wives who probably wanted to do shopping, so they didn't accumulate wealth. No, just kidding. Wealth, wives, he had all these kids, and even though he denied being king, he lived like a king, and he made some major mistakes. I love the, the verse in Proverbs 30 when it comes to money. Proverbs 30, 8, 9. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. God says you cannot serve, I mean, the Lord says you cannot serve both God and mammon. You cannot serve both God and money. People have a tendency to put their trust in wealth, in money, and not in God. And that's the danger. In closing, I think I've said in closing three times now. I apologize. But I'm very sincere now. In closing, as a longtime uh, veteran runner and uh, track coach, cross-country coach, I've often emphasized finishing the race well. Finish the race well. When we studied Galatians earlier this year, Galatians 5, 7, Paul told the people in Galatia, you were running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? We need to stay in our lane, the lane that God's given us, so that we're not disqualified as we run the race. All of us should be like the Apostle Paul, who said in 2 Timothy 4, 7, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I have kept the faith. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's finish the race well. Okay? Okay, let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for these examples in your word. And Lord, you, you challenged us today. Gideon was a great man, a great man of faith. You used him in great victory. But yet, Lord, there were some things he did at the end of his life that you were not pleased with. I pray, Lord, that we would fight the good fight, that we would keep the faith all the way to the end, that no one will cut into our lane and cut us off, that we would obey the truth to the very end. We thank you that you're a long-suffering and patient God with us. You're a forgiving God, for we fail many times. I pray that we would continue to mature in our faith and grow in you. We pray this in all of God's people said, amen.